Sehr geehrter Herr Professor Assmann, lieber Herr Professor Kircher, uh, dear Professor Assmann, dear Professor Kircher, dear Tobias Assmann, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly welcome you to our sixth Thomas Mann lecture, which together with the ETH Library and the Professorship for Literature under Andreas Kirchner and the ETH of Zurich has been organized together for two years now. We have had to have these speeches, these evenings, virtually only. Now we can sit here together and meeting now physically after two years, after this pandemic, is very special. You can see our hall is full, full of enthusiasm. We are sitting here, and I think we can feel that this encounter also in the physical world does have a different quality than the virtual one. The Thomas Mann lecture is now uh, taking again place here in person in our main hall of the ETH Zurich, because it is here that the archive of Thomas Mann after six years of hibernation, temporary hibernation, it has now found its final location, hopefully for an eternal summer. Now the Thomas Mann archive is back to the center and we are fully working to build up a new exhibition, which will be opened already next year here in our main building. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my enthusiasm for a corporalis congressio in spatio reali, so for an encounter in the physical, certainly does not um, disregard the online participants of our presentation today. So I would like to warmly welcome them. For all of those who are not fully mastering German language, I do not, I am not pointing out to a Latin simultaneous interpretation, but to an English. So, ladies and gentlemen, within the framework of our annual uh, Thomas Mann event, we always invite personal, we always invite very special specialists here for this event. Our speaker today is reputed far beyond just liter literature science. He's Egyptologist, he specialized in religion. Um, he is part, together with his wife, Elaide Asman, who is also here with us, whom I would both like to warmly welcome. Professor Kilke will then afterwards comment further and introduce Professor Asman further. I would just like to comment him as a real connoisseur and specialist on Thomas Mann's work. Joseph's novels is, for example, one of those which he has commented on together with the Thomas Mann ETH library in the Fisher um, publishing house. Referring to the works of Thomas Mann between 1939 and 1943, which is at the center of today, Jan Asman will be speaking about Thomas Mann's journey to the East, Joseph and his brothers. We will hear what he will be sharing with us on this journey to the East. And similarly to his friend, uh, Hermann Hesse, how both of them together had to prove themselves in a time of extreme crisis. More than this, I don't want to vent yet here. At the end, I would like to warmly invite you to an aperitif which will be served outside. Now, before I turn the word on to Andreas Kilchir, for the president of the oratorium, I would like to thank Professor Kilcher for his whole engagement here within the Thomas Mann Lectures and, of course, by Tobias Anslinger, my colleague who is in charge of the literature archive here of the ETH Library and also all of my colleagues of the library who helped us in preparing this event. A very warm thank you to all of you. And now I would like to turn over to Andreas Kilcher. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ba. Dear ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome also on my behalf, dear Jan Asman, Elaida Asman here to Zurich. And more particularly, thank welcome here to the ETH of Zurich, to this institution which has the real privilege of having the heritage of Thomas Mann 
following his will and making it available to research. Now, as has been mentioned already, I would be introducing Jan Asman to you. The question is, is it necessary at all to introduce him? Probably it isn't. You will know that as Egyptologist at the University of Heidelberg, he has been working and teaching for decades, all the all the way up to 2003, and yet I do want to add a few more specific bits and pieces which are perhaps less known on his work and career, which makes him a real experienced uh, and competent, competent ex specialist beyond just being Egyptologist. He was frequently also an invited professor also at the Collège de France, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, at the Oxford University in Yale. He had guest professorships in Chicago. He has many doctoral honorary degrees, for example, also for the Westfalische University in Münster, in Yale, at the Hebrew University. He's a member of many societies, such as the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences. He has received many awards as, for example, the Max Planck Research Prize, the Sigmund Freud Prize for Scientific Prosa, Kaliaspos Prize, together with Elida Asman, the Balsam Pass uh, Prize, together also with his wife Elida, and the Peace Prize of German of German literature, also together with his wife Elida Asman, which also shows that the two of them are a very strong team as well which is very well known throughout. Now, if I would have to say something on his work of research, I would have to introduce you here to a complete oeuvre of his life. I cannot do that here completely. Uh, dozens of monographies, of essay, hundreds of essays, an enormously productive scientist Jan Asman is. His research, starting from the antique world, from the old, the ancient Egypt, but way beyond as well. We can say that what Jan Asman has actually demonstrated is, in a way, an, ar an archaeology of our cultural, historical uh, science. These are quest responses to questions. What characterizes our culture? Where does it come from? What are the historical and Id uh, idealistic uh, preconditions? And what are its depths? As Egyptologists, these interests are focused, particularly on questions of religion, philosophy, for example, as the term of Mahat, justice and mortality in ancient Egypt, the death beyond in ancient Egypt, a stone and time, ancient society. The reception story of Egypt was also of interest to Jan Asman. For example, with a book with the title of Wisdom and Mystery, the picture of the Greeks of Egypt, or then all the way to Freud, Moses the Egyptian, a trace of memory. Egypt is, of course, the idea, the role model of an imagination which reaches far into the modern times. That is what Jan Asman researched, all the way reaching into music even. But going beyond Egyptology, these are also more comprehensive topics which interest him. For example, the creation of monotheism, of course, always connected to Egypt, the ancient Israelite history, the key word of, yes, the exile of the Israelites of Egypt was of particular interest to him at the time, also in order to understand what are the roots of monotheism, where are they to be found, which he also finds in violence, but then also the mosaic distinction or monotheism and the language of violence. And then, beyond it, the research on the term of cultural memory, cultural heritage, has been has also been based on the whole concept of the collective conscience of Morris Halbach's 
has been a topic for Jan Asman, and then a multitude of studies which follow very basic questions of religion, of cultural history, cultural science, such as terms of the transformation, the completion, magic and, relig and religion, etc. Now, we need to turn to Thomas Mann, of course. And by this, we return to Egypt via Thomas Mann back to Egypt. So, amongst the awards, I could have also mentioned that Jan Asman received the Thomas Mann Prize of the Hansa city of Lübeck in the year 2011. I think looking back to a monography with the title of Thomas Mann and Egypt, my, uh, a myth and monotheism in Joseph and his brothers, 2006, and I would say this was one of the starting points for the greater public of perceiving that Jan Asman also has dealt with the tetralogy of Joseph and his brothers, that with the logical consequence that this long-time expected critical edition of Joseph and his brothers by Thomas Mann has been edited by Thomas Mann, a monumental work, one has to say. There are monumental works whose edition is actually, or editing is a monumental work. If you see the commentaries, you will quickly be, you will quickly be, uh, realize that this is really a masterwork of editing and commenting. You have to realize that behind this, uh, the books, Joseph and his brother stands a complete library. Thomas Mann called it his Oriental library, which has to be read has to be studied in detail, and these books can be viewed in the Thomas Mann Library physically, but also virtually. I warmly invite you to verify it for yourself. E-books, which all those books which Thomas Mann has marked, has commented in the project over the last years. We have researchers, and exactly those books, which we have, he has read for the Joseph and his brother's novels. They have been kept and they give an impression of what was required in order to comment these four books, these four novels. So a tremendous work of Thomas Mann's, uh, which shows Thomas Mann's knowledge, his scholarly approach, but also of him as a witness of his time. So as a counterpoint to his time, he was, of course, standing and writing in his time. So this tetralogy, I mean, if I just call it a novel that is far too little, one can view it as a type of prehistory of humanity inspired by a journey, a journey to the East. You will hear more of it, of course. But it doesn't only profit by scholarly knowledge, by book knowledge, but by a by experiencing knowledge with the idea which does not always transmit it freely that this story would be shared also as a counterpoint at the time of history of the time when these four books uh, were published, which was between 1939 and 1943. The first one when Thomas Mann already found himself in the Zurich exile in Kusnacht at the Lake of Zurich and the last one in 1943, when he was already in Los Angeles. So there are many journeys undertaken here, not only to the east, but also far into the Occident, all the way to the very far western end. Now, while these novels embark on their journey to the east, it is interesting to see that they begin with a journey to the hell, because the journey to hell is actually the beginning point, the starting point of the first novel. And I'm very interested if this will also be part of this journey that you will be taking us on, and also how these journeys will look, Jan Asman. We are very much looking forward to this presentation now. Thomas Mann, um, The Journey to the East, Joseph and his brothers, please, Jan Asman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dear virtual listeners, I hope I can be heard till 
be the end of the hall? Yes, am I audible enough? Everything okay? Good. So I would like to start. First of all, I would very much like to thank you for the honor of being able to give this discourse here tonight, for the friendly introduction, for the laudatio, which has been extended to me by my friend Andreas Kilchir, and the wonderful uh, care that I have received throughout this journey here to Zurich with my friend Tobias Anslinger. So I'm very happy to be here with you and to be able to share with you on Thomas Mann's journey to the East. So the title of my lecture alludes to Hermann Hesse's story, The Journey to the East, which he started, which he published in 1932. The journeyers to the East, to which he then dedicated his later novel, The Glass Bead Game, is actually he views as a secret society based on the unmistakable model of Freemasonry. He situates his narrative in the period after the Great War. And Hermann Hesse always means the First World War with this, in which, as he writes, there was an extraordinary state of unreality, a readiness for the superreal, phrase into the realm of a coming psychocracy. At that time, it then continues. Referring to the slide, now broadcast it. At that time, when I had the good fortune to join the League, namely immediately after the end of the Great War, our country, by this he means Germany, although he's writing in Switzerland, was full of saviors, prophets and discipleships, of pre-sentiments of the end of the world, or hopes for the dawn of a Third Reich. During this period, so this post-war period, time, in 1926, Thomas Mann began with the preliminary work on his gigantic novel, Joseph and His Brothers. So these are four novels from between 1933 to 1943. Hesse, for his part, set about in 1930, writing his his uh, big novel, Glasperlenspiel, The Glassbead Game, which was published in Zurich in 1943 and won him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1946. Now, as Hesse explicitly dedicated his great novel to the journey to the East, one may well understand this project as his spiritual journey to the East, which is why this term of journey to the East I would like to generalize. It's a th- It is a spiritual journey, preferably to the East, out of the present, both in the spatial and temporal sense. The first person to embark on this journey to the East in the sense was, of course, Goethe, the guiding star of both Hesse and Thomas Mann. Goethe set out in 1814 on a poetic journey to the Orient, the results of which he published then in 1819 as the West Eastern Divan. So he could not have staged this departure more effectively than with his opening poem, which he titled Hegir, which is French for the Hitra, the emigration of Mohammed and his followers from Mecca to Medina. North and west and south, splinter, thrones burst, empires tremble, flee thou in the pure east, patriarchal air to taste. Goethe's west-eastern divan is thus understood as a spiritual emigration from the Europe of another post-war period, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and there in this post-war time, their repressive restorative atmosphere, which then culminated in Metternich's reforms. Now, on such an eastward journey, the others followed later. So, 
In addition, apart from Hermann Hesse, I would like to count Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann, 1925, literally traveled to the Orient. It was a three-week trip to the Mediterranean, which also took him to Egypt. And he writes about it, 1925, in the Fossischer newspaper of 12th of April, 1925. The Orient. Yes, yes, I have taken it in. I carry away timeless images, unchanged, since the days of Isis and the sparrow-headed gods. I saw the brown men of Kimi pulling up the buckets on the clay banks of the Nile, the farmers with primitive tools tilling the wholly fertilized soil, the ox turning the water wheel. I saw the camel, the wise, shabby, useful, old, millennia in the look of his grotesque and clever serpent head. Still I see it, packed with turbaned riders, one behind the other, moving in a long line on the horizon. On the horizon. I will always see it if I want. The Orient has become mine after all. Back in Munich, he begins the preliminary work on his novel, which he stages as a journey to the time to the well of the past. So this journey to hell, which Andreas Kirche just referred to, a time travel, which takes him to the 14th century BC, spatially, to Canaan. And so Thomas Mann's tremendous novel work I would like to view as a spiritual journey to the East, which takes him away from this increasingly unbearable present of Nazi terror and war, just as Hesse did on his spiritual journey, on his spiritual journey to the East in his main work, The Glass Beat Game. For me, it was a matter of two things. Hesse writes to Rudolf Panwitz in 1955, to build up a spiritual space in which I could breathe and live, in spite of all the poisoning of the world, and secondly, to express the, resi the resistance of the spirit against the barbaric powers and possibly to strengthen my friends over in Germany in their resistance and perseverance. Also for Thomas Mann, the work on the Joseph Project was, as he wrote in a letter to his son Klaus Mann on January 24, 1942, my support and staff since our non-return to Germany. I am grateful to this work, which has been my support and staff on a path that often led through such dark valleys. He writes this in his retrospective 16 years. It is here where he basically gives accountability on his work on the Joseph Nozovos. Even more dramatic, Hesse describes the saving, healing power of writing even more in his journey to the East. The fictional author and protagonist, behind whose initials stood H. H. unmistakably Hesse himself, by this he saves himself with the project of writing a book about the journey to the East in order to save life, by giving it meaning again. So for him, despite the impossibility of recounting the tremendous experience, this book was the only possibility of my salvation from nothingness, from chaos, from suicide. But also for Thomas Mann's journey to the East, like Hesse's, he was also concerned with two things. He wanted to build up a spiritual space in which he could live and breathe. And secondly, he wanted to express the resistance of the spirit against the barbaric powers. Hesse's and Thomas Mann's journeys to the East were written in resistance to the spirit, or rather, to the unspirit of the times. So this double motive of survival and resistance, I would like to add 
To these two journeyers to the east, a third comrade in arms, who in the same years, he set out on a comparable major project, the philosopher Karl Jaspers. Karl Jaspers' book of The Origin and Goal of History was written at about the same time as Hesse's glass bead game and can also be described as a journey to the East. To the National Socialism, which muzzled him in 1937 with a ban on teaching and publishing, he reacted with an intellectual emigration. In his philosophical autobiography, he writes, since 1937, so I'm not going to read everything on the PowerPoint slide, I have acquired through, through reading a new knowledge of the world. So it's about the world, it's not just about the Orient. Here. So spiritually, I enjoyed to stay in China, feeling there a common origin of being human against the barbarianism of my own environment. But at the same time, however, the interest went to humanity as a whole, in which the reason and the standard should become tangible in order to assert itself in the present. So China and humanity are the key words which are relevant here. This collage has said Thomas Mann, Jaspers. You might find it random, but it is exactly these three books which I read at the age of 17 years old, which then motivated me to undertake my own journey to the East, to Egypt, and which uh, have inspired me to specific books until today. Now, Jasper's journey to the East leads him spatially to China, temporar temporarily to the centuries around 500 BC, which he discovered as the Axis time. For him, around the middle of the first millennium BC, the human being with whom we live to this day was created, which means our own spiritual world. In this age, he writes, and this is the time in which we think until today, these are actually the approaches of the world religions from which people live until today. They are extraordinary things which crowd together in this period. In China, Confucius and Lao Tzu live. All directions of the Chinese philosophy are developed. In India, we have the Upanishads. Buddha lived. All philosophical possibilities were developed up to skepticism, materialism, sophistic, nihilism, as in China. In Iran, Zarathustra was teaching this demanding worldview of the fight between good and evil. In Palestine, the prophets appeared. Greece saw Homer, the philosophers, the, tra the, the tragics. Everything which is only indicated by such names grew in these centuries, up almost simultaneously in China, India, and the Occident, without knowing mutually from each other. That we have this present until today, this demands writing. Who wants to deviate from thoughts and from what is you, one is used to? It is only writing which can develop um, and, and uphold for later societies which may be more receptive. And so on the first level of the written, of the written cultural memory that the great texts come into being. But this also pre-requires canonizing. So the fact that we may live with these texts until today, that is due to the second stage in which these texts were declared classics or canonical texts and made the subject of incessant commentary, which ensured that despite the growing distance of the advancing present to their language, their view of the world, 
Uh, throughout every crisis, they remained readable, legible, and they remained in power. This work, which today still occupies us on cultural memory, has ensured the emergence of, of this horizon of understanding and memory. This axis time is a matter of cultural or, more precisely, intercultural education. This is what Jaspers writes. Through consciousness and memory, through transmission of spiritual acquisition, that is how liberation from the mere present occurs. And Aleida Asman wrote that it is through study that specifically humanistic mixture of scholarship, memory and enthusiasm, an anachronic space of transhistorical simultaneity is created into which one can cross over from the present at any time. As a fourth journeyer to the East, I want to add Sigmund Freud to the boat. His last book, which he published in exile in London, and which was published shortly before his death in 1939, has an extremely eventful genesis. In the early summer of 1934, Freud set out on what was for him a very unusual project. He began a historical novel, a Moses novel, from letters, but also from the work itself. It can be inferred what prompted him to take this bold step, an acute concern, a seductive stimulus, and an incendiary idea. The acute concern was the rise of National Socialism and its anti-Jewish policies, in which the age-old anti-Semitism had once again taken on a new murderous face. The seductive stimulus consisted in the 1933 and 34 published first two Joseph novels <coughs> of Thomas Mann, which motivated Freud to tackle something similar about Moses. And the igniting idea, finally, consisted in the rediscovery of Achnaton's and the surprising existence of an Egyptian monotheism, which put the age-old constructions of an Egyptian Moses and the Egyptian origin of the monotheism, he proclaimed, in a completely new light. In a letter dated September 30, 1934, Sigmund Freud writes to Arnold Zweig. For I wrote something myself during a time of relative vacation. He had lost his clients, right? By the then in Germany already uh, reigning anti Semitism. Yeah. How, is, how do you want to call it? Um, this very authoritative, authoritarian republic. So, during a time of relative vacation, he writes, out of perplexity as to what to do with the surplus of leisure, I wrote something myself. And this took me so much against original intention that everything else fell by the wayside. The starting point of my work is familiar to you. It was the same as for your bilance, your balance. It was a balance of German Judaism. In view of the new persecutions, one wonders again how the Jew has become and why he has contracted this undying hatred. I soon had the formula out. Moses had created the Jew, and my work was given the title the Man Moses, a historical novel. Out of the first version, the historical novel, 28 handwritten pages have survived, as well as 10 pages of an appendix of critical discussion of secondary literature, especially the Moses book of Hugo Gressman, with 13 pages of notes. 
And it is this appendix which refers to the novel as a completed work. Also in the quoted letter, Freud writes of his finished essay. In the subtitle of this historical novel, Freud drops the subtitle of historical novel, as can be seen from a letter to Max Eitingen. I'm no good for historical novels after all. It remains for Thomas Mann. It must have become clear to him that combining two so different genres as the historical novel and the scientific treatise in the same book would not work. Now, Freud lands with his journey to the East in the same place and the same time as Thomas Mann in Egypt and Canaan at the time of Echnaton in the 14th century BC. Common to both projects, Mann's and Freud's is the prominent role which both give to King Achnaton, who in an unprecedented religious overthrow abolished the traditional world of gods and substituted the exclusive cult of the sun, so a kind of monotheism, in place of the traditional cult. Obviously, for Thomas Mann, as for Sigmund Freud, the rediscovered Echnaton was the central motive for embarking on this journey to the East. Both of them wanted to bring their hero of Moses, or Joseph, as closely as possible to Echnaton. For Thomas Mann, Echnaton is the king to whom the dream of the seven fat and seven lean years applied. For Freud, he was the king to whom Moses served as a distinguished Egyptian in the highest position. Now, in a letter to Lou Andreas Salome, he summarizes this thesis in a very clear manner. Moses was not a Jew. He was a distinguished Egyptian, a high official, a priest, perhaps a prince of the royal dynasty, a zealous follower of the monotheistic faith, which Pharaoh Amenhotep IV, around 1350 BC, had made the ruling religion. And that is when he then took on the name of Echnaton, so identical. When after the death of the pharaoh, the new religion collapsed and the 18th dynasty expired, the ambitious man had lost all his hopes, decided to leave the fatherland, create a new people for himself, whom he wanted to educate in the great religion of his master. He condescended to the Semitic tribe, which since the times of the Hyksos had remained in the land, placed himself at their head, led them out of bondage into freedom, gave them the spiritualized religion of Aton, and as an expression of sanctification, as well as a means of separation, he introduced circumcision, which was a native custom among the Egyptians and only among them. What the Jews later praised of their god, Yahweh, that he had chosen them as his people and delivered them from Egypt, literally applied to Moses, with the election and the gift of the new religion he created the Jew. The Amarna Times covers about 20 years from the middle of the 14th century BC. Thomas Mann and Sigmund Freud had the bravery to use their Moses and Joseph fantasies and place them in a time which we are informed about through numerous sources, better than any other period of the Egyptian history. Over no other pharaoh of the Egyptian history do we know this much and so many diverse things as exactly about Echnaton. Out of the memory, the Egyptian analytic completely removed king, who only through archaeology of later 19th and 20th century could be rediscovered. Mann and Freud were busy with the question of the origin of biblical monotheism, which the most diverse authors already since the antique had been dealing with, who, however, knew nothing of Echnaton. And yet, this rediscovery of the past 75 years only of Echnaton were enough to make him to a figure 
which Joseph could hardly stand behind in this mythical power. In 1894, the young James Henry Breasted discovered in his Berlin dissertation, which, by the way, uh, he handed in in Latin in Berlin, the relationship between the great hymn of Echnaton and the 104th Psalm. No later Egyptian text comes as close to this hymn as the Hebrew Psalm. In his widely read history of Egypt, Breasted portrays Echnaton as a founder of religion and his religion as a pure monotheism. Arthur Weigel, then in his fully mythified The Forgotten King in his novelistic biography in 1910. In addition, there were the spectacular archaeological finds, 1887 to 1894, of the Clay Tablet Archive with the diplomatic correspondence. In 19 Egypt, with all the powers around it, with its vassals in Canaan, 1912 to 1913, the sculptor's workshop with the overwhelming portraits, and 1922, the Tutankhamun's tomb. Echnaton's appearance in Joseph's fourth novel, Joseph the Nurturer, or the Provider, is at the climax, the culmination of the mythical career of this forgotten pharaoh. While Joseph was never forgotten, in his Hebrew a career from the shepherd boy to the incarcerated delinquent had risen to the Grand Vizier of Egypt, the ostracized pharaoh in his archaeological and literary career rose from over 3,000 years of oblivion to become one of the most important figures in human history. Moses and Joseph, however, remained figures of legends, without archaeological traces. Freud's interpretation under the antique authors of the geograph Straben, following him, an Egyptian priest by the name of Moises, out of discontent with the Egyptian religions in the country, decides to leave it, and with many like-minded, he emigrates to Judea. Strabon's Moses discards Egyptian tradition to show the gods in, tea, in animal form. His teaching relies in the recognition that this one being of God, which encompasses all of us, earth and sea, heaven and earth, and the nature of things. Freud was one of the first who brought in this newly discovered Echnaton in this thousands of years old discourse. For him it was clear that the monotheistic thought came from Egypt. Thomas Mann, however, saw it differently in this major religion conversation which he had planned as a highlight of his whole novelic work. It is Joseph who would spiritualize Echnaton's cosmic sun faith, not the sun, but the lord of the sun, the religion or the cult should serve. For Freud, Echnaton is the giving and Moses the taking. For Thomas Mann, Joseph is the one who is the giving. That is what monotheism is about, worship of one single God. And here, Joseph and Echnaton are in agreement. The distinction here is just the term of this one. For Echnaton, and this is now in this discussion, which Thomas Mann views as uh, the highlight of his, of his novels in the fourth one, for Echnaton, it is the sun as a body of the heavens. It is clear all life on earth depends from the sun. Without the sun, there would be no time, no space, no becoming, nor decaying. The sun is our father in heaven. In heaven is what Joseph would counter. We don't see him. No picture, no image can reciprocate him. Not the sun is God, but its hidden creator and Lord. The historical Echnaton here would not have participated different to the one of Mums, who in this whole fine-tuning of his teaching takes up enthusiastically. This is exactly the point in which Freud's Moses also goes beyond the teaching of his king, of Echnaton. 
the step from sensuality to pure spirituality, progress in the spirit. Freud counts, titles this, uh, the, the respective chapter of his book. This was also the requirement for Thomas Mann. They could not have turned away in a more clear way of the unspirit of the NS times. Sigmund Freud's reason, Moses and the Exodus, to place it in the post amana time was particular because Moses was to be identified as an Egyptian and a follower of the Aton religion and in order to be able to explain the biblical monotheism. Also, Thomas Mann had very good reasons for this unusual time setting of his Joseph story because from the beginning, for him, it was about the big discourse that Joseph's monotheisms with a confronting Echnaton's son belief. Besides, we're very well documented about this time, which we have already <coughs> mentioned. Und das kam and this, of course, helped Thomas Mann's interest in, in accuracy, in detail richness of this narrative localization. No. So now I'm coming to the third chapter of the main conversation, the big discourse, the highlight which Thomas Mann had planned. The dimension of different sources Thomas Mann encounters with this invention of this big discourse, this major encounter for which there is no source whatsoever where Thomas Mann takes the Hebrew, spiritual, Egyptian, sensually cosmic monotheism, confronts. And so already in the year of 1928, when the first of the four Joseph's novels had only just begun, and he had decided on a reading of the already existing chapters in Vienna and published in the word before, Wort zuvor, in the Viennese new press media, as and there he announces already this discourse as the highlight, the targeted highlight of the whole. I have reason to hope that Joseph, this, this, the sprout of the young Hebraic monotheism with his pharaoh would have had a good discourse and conversation with his pharaoh. So this encounter was planned from the beginning as a highlight of the book and an actual goal of his journey to hell. Das große Gespräch. Im April the big discourse in April 1941, the time has then come. The decisive chapter is opened. The great conversation between him and the young Amenhotep, which would lead to Joseph's exaltation, this had to be done with care, because there, there is then not much left to spoil. It is the Seine Affaire. After it, not much can happen to me, he reads. He writes a letter to his translator. And then to Agnes Meyer, he continues, as the wife of the owner and uh, a publisher of the Washington Post, who was at the time his uh, supporter. So he writes to her, the Hermes motive, the moon motive, the rogue motive, the mediator motive, now emerge in all their detail and full instrumentation. And then, today I have continued to write patiently and cheerfully on the great conversation between Amenhotep and Joseph. The production grants enjoyment, not so much through itself, as through the sensing and thinking that accompanies it. But then it becomes difficult. My head is shamefully tired. Everything I have to wring and force from it. This is already 1941. I'm perhaps about to spoil this damned religious conversation because I get lost in blind alleys. And out of fatigue, the motives become confused to me. The scene was very difficult to arrange. And it did not turn out as well as I had thought, but perhaps still good enough. And then, it is now what it is. Perhaps it would have turned out better if I had not had to rest it from a bad fatigue. 
Worin bestand diese Schwierigkeit? Now, what were these difficulties which made it so difficult for Thomas Mann? Sie bestand in dem it was in the plan of taking this great conversation with Pharaoh and he wrote this in his presentation on Joseph and his brothers. So in this big conversation, the mythologies of all the world, the Hebrew, the Babylonic, the Egyptian, the Greek, are all completely mixed together in such a colorful manner that one will hardly think of having a biblical Jewish historical book in front of you. And then to Karl Kiremi, who had just sent him a book on Hermes, that book he immediately integrated into this great conversation. So here he shares actually this whole myth. And it is to him that he writes in all these mythologies, the Jewish, the Greek, etc., where he can mix them up completely, that it is not about a literary license in the end. Also, was war das Problem? So, what was the problem, actually? Thomas Mann believed in the unity of human spirit. In monotheism, the biblical and the monotheism of Echnaton, it's about the difference. It is through this that the myths are banished. In the big conversation, everything gets mixed up again. So on one hand, the Amarna theology, the big hymnus, should be embedded with sentences from the John Gospel, the Gospel of John. The Christian message of God of love should become transparent there. But on the other hand, also, Joseph's mythical identity should become Hermes-like. But also the literary license of the novel by which Thomas Mann's vision of a unity of the human spirit would hardly be feasible in this great conversation. Yeah. Nun habe ich das vierte Kapitel angekündigt. Und Now I have announced the fourth chapter. Ja. And I would just like, I have placed it here in brackets because for time reasons I cannot so enter here into detail. It is so interesting, it would actually give enough material for a whole entire different conversation or presentation. So I just do have to skip it. So briefly, the biblical Joseph story is not just a question of the chapters of 37, 42 in the book of Genesis, but it is actually a literary masterwork in itself of the uh, ancient literature. And the special thing about it is the psychological internal perspective of the char characters, of the fears, of the movement, the emotions, the weeping of Joseph. So the unknown writer of the book of Joseph was in a way the Thomas Mann of that time. So these are two things that basically found each other here. But again, here another time. So I will turn directly over to the fifth chapter. As Thomas Mann when Thomas Mann, on the 5th of January, 1943, finally set the final sentence under the last novel of his Joseph Cycle, he did not immediately break off his journey to the East. And he also did not immediately clear away his extensive Egyptological, Orientalist, Biblical, Scientific Library, which can be viewed here in Zurich in the Thomas Mann Archive, which he had gathered around him for the Joseph Project. So he didn't put it away in order to make room for his new major project, Dr. Faustus, but rather he sets about a commissioned work for which he needed this library once again for this was to be about Moses. So, a type of continuation of the biblical material, and second, after the first book of Moses, 
and the exodus after the entry into Egypt. An American journalist planned a film about the Ten Commandments, which then, however, because he did not have sufficient funding, he had to publish it as a book. So, I'm in Roar Robinson, The Ten Commandments, Ten Short Novels of Hitler's War Against the Moral Code. I'm in Robinson. So, ten prominent writers were invited to contribute a short story on one of the Ten Commandments, including none other than Thomas Mann, who was supposed to treat the First Commandment. As honorarium, a thousand dollars, a lot of money in those days, which he could make good use of. The aim of the book was to educate and awaken the world to the true nature of Hitler's war as a frontal assault on human civilization, law, morality, religion in general, and to shake up as well. And this gave Thomas Mann the opportunity to catch up on one point which had remained open in his journey to the East. So this was not just about creating a space to breathe freely, but also to express resistance. And so the Joseph work was actually written against the time as a countering, as a counterpoint even, which is what it really was. It was a counterworld for the presence which had become ever more unbearable for him. And now this Moses world was an engaged political intervention in the current times. And he ends it with actual, a formal cursing of Adolf Hitler as the current anti-Moses, the destroyer of everything which Moses had built. Thomas Mann takes up this mandate by universalizing the Ten Commandments. From the constitution of God's people, he makes the ABC of the human condition. In a letter to Robert Hartman, dated April 7, 1943, he writes, the tendency towards some kind of world organization is unmistakably present. Nothing of the kind is possible without a determining dose of secularized Christianity, without a new Bill of Rights, a basic law of human rights and human decency, which, independent of governmental forms, would guarantee a minimum of respect for Homo Dei universally. Five years later, this dream came true, when in 1948, this new Bill of Rights was realized by the UN in the form of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this was now not the achievement of Thomas Mann's narrative, but of René Cassin, the French diplomat and lawyer, who drafted the text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for which he then got 1968 the Peace Nobel Prize. But Thomas Mann's tireless appeals to the spirit of humanity, especially in his Joseph's novels, were a cultural document, insightful and impressive, and appealed to the spirit of humanity. Thank you very much. Three things remain for me still to complete. First of all, I would like to thank, as you heard, enthusiastic applause. And yes, we are also enriched by this look to deeply into history of the ancient world. And yet also its combination with contemporary time, with presence, as clearly as it can only be said here. 
Das hat, glaube ich, sehr beeindruckt. Und I think that was very impressive and I would like to thank you very much for it. And it is here that I want to thank not just you, dear Jan, but also Tobias Manslinger and all the co-workers of the Thomas Mann Archive who contributed so much for this event to take place here in this manner today. Thank you so much to all of you. And I would like to thank you for having attended, for participating. And secondly, we would really like to take you up on it that another presentation will follow on the biblical Joseph. Not now, but a next time. We will get back to that, of course. And thirdly, is that I would like to invite, to repeat again the invitation of Raphael Ball, that an apero is waiting for you outside. We will not be discussing now here in pleno, but amongst each other then in the smaller circle. Thank you so much to all of you for attending, and good night.